Today I want to draw your attention to a word found in verse number 2. It's the word Bethesda. And it's by a pool. And today I would like to label my thoughts with these four words. The pool of Bethesda. The pool of Bethesda. By means of introduction, one of my least favorite things to do is swimming. I don't like to swim. Uh, one of the reasons is because I swam all the time as a kid and in my teenage years, and now I'm just tired of dealing with the, uh, the earaches that you get from it and all those different things. But I was intrigued to find out that there are some large swimming pools in this world today. Would you? How, how many of you think you've ever been to a large swimming pool? I mean, you ever been to Emerald Point? They have some big pools there. The Lazy River is kind of like a, just a big pool. They're huge pools. But did you know that there is a pool that is close to a mile long in this world today? In December of 2006, the largest swimming pool in the world opened its doors. Its length is 3,323 feet, very close to a mile long, just a couple thousand feet shy. And this place has a pool in a private resort in Chile. It is 20 acres. It takes 66 million gallons of water to pump into that pool. And all the water is from the Pacific Ocean. And by the way, it is filtered and treated. The total cost for this project was $1.5 to $2 billion. In my opinion, somebody has a little bit more money than what they have to deal with. Did you know that it costs $4 million yearly to maintenance this swimming pool? I mean, that's a large pool. Now, the passage in John chapter 5 deals with a pool, but not to that magnificent scale. This pool is a little bit different. Instead of the largest swimming pool in the world, this is a pool of where people would go to to receive healing for their bodies. And today, within this passage of Scripture, I believe that there are three biblical truths that we can discover while at this swimming pool in the days of Jesus Christ. Hey, maybe you like swimming, maybe you can't swim. Well, maybe you, maybe you, you just like to sit by the side of the pool and enjoy the sun baking on your skin. Whatever you like to do, come with me in John chapter 5 and let's look at this scene, whether you're sitting inside the pool with your feet in, whether you're sitting outside the pool, whether you're watching by the fence. Let's look at this pool and see what happens when Jesus Christ begins to deal with this impotent man. By the way, uh, J. Vernon McGee was, was preaching in a meeting and he asked a young boy to stand and read this passage of Scripture. And when he got to verse number 3, the young boy said in the in these lay a great multitude of important folk. <laughs> and J. Vernon McGee went on to say, yes, the impotent people are the important people in the eyes of God. Now within this passage of Scripture, in verses 1 through 2, we're going to discover this. The pool of Bethesda is a place of receiving mercy. In verses 3 through 9, we're going to discover this. The pool of Bethesda is a place of healing infirmity. And then verses 10 through 16, we'll discover this. The pool of Bethesda is a place of cleansing iniquity. Will you come with me as we look at this magnificent scene in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ? Remember in John chapter 4, he dealt with this woman at the well, and he told her everything that she'd ever did. And then he comes and he heals, after that scene, he heals the nobleman's son, a royal officer. In his day, healed his son. And now the Bible says that after all of chapter 4 transpired, there was a feast of the Jews. And Jesus goes to Jerusalem. In verses 1 through 2, we discover this. The pool of Bethesda is a place of receiving mercy. The pool of Bethesda is a place of receiving mercy. Verse number 2 says this. Notice these words. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. Now this term Bethesda, it, it has a few different meanings. It literally means a place of kindness 
And it literally means a place of mercy. So here at this pool, there was a time when these individuals who were blind, who could not see, individuals who were lame, who could not walk, individuals who were just who were who, who were consumed with leprosy and all sorts of diseases, they were by this pool and they would receive mercy, something they did not deserve. Now, I want to take you back a couple years in my lifetime into the 11th grade. Now, in my 11th grade schedule, I had four classes, and my first period class was this, was this plague of the devil called chemistry. Now, maybe some of you are good at chemistry, um, but, but for me and myself, the only way I was good at chemistry was that I paid attention in class, took the notes, and, and, uh, and really just listened to what the teacher had to say. And I remember... The first part of the semester, I had to be in the class. I was listening, I was taking notes, I was doing everything as a student that I should be doing. And then one day I decided to get a little lazy and not pay attention. And that one day turned to another day, and then by the time I knew it, I was a little far behind and I just really couldn't catch back up. And so I changed that B into a D. Still passed the class. But I remember the day, now if you understand anything about the public school system, a lot of times you don't necessarily learn the subject, you learn how to prepare for the standard of learning examinations, okay? So they teach you enough about the subject so that you can pass these tests. And I'll never forget the day came where I had the, this chemistry SOL, and all I had was the calculator, and, and it was multiple choice, that's what it was. So I go through this test, and I, I, I go through it, and I said, wow. It would be, literally be a miracle from God if I passed this test. So I just start punching in figures in the calculator, and if I could ever get close to one of the figures that was an answer, I would just circle and go on. And I didn't think about it in the test. I just did the best I could with the knowledge that I had. But I deserved to fail that test because I didn't listen in class. The last part, I got far behind, stopped doing the homework, just didn't deserve to pass the test. On the SOLs, a perfect score is a 600. A passing score is a 400. And anything 399 or below is you fail. And you have to take the test again. And then again, and if you don't pass the test the third time, you have to retake the entire class. And I'll never forget the time came where we were to go to our teachers and we were to receive our final score. And I walked into the classroom. I was with a friend of mine and uh, I looked at the piece of paper and there it said 411. My hands <laughs> reached up to the sky. I said, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. That day, my friends, I received mercy um, from Almighty God. And I passed that test, passed the class with a D, and life went on for me to the senior year. Now, I said that to say this, that here at this pool was kind of like the situation, me walking into that classroom and receiving a passing grade in my chemistry SOL. Here, these sick people were laying at this pool, and at a moment's notice, they could literally receive the mercy of Almighty God. The Bible tells us in Titus chapter number 3 that we are saved not according to the works that we have done, but according to God's own mercy. In Psalm 86, the Bible tells us about these words in verse number 15. But thou, O Lord, art a, art a God full of compassion and gracious, a long-suffering and plenteous in mercy. God is a God who delights in giving people something they do not deserve. In Psalm 117, and verse number 2, the shortest chapter in the Bible, the Bible says, For His merciful kindness is great towards us. And I don't know about you today, but I can look at this chapter, and this individual that Jesus Christ is getting ready to heal, who's been sick for 38 years, notices that Jesus Christ is a God who was plentiful in mercy. In Psalm 136, if you never read Psalm 136, I invite you and encourage you encourage you to do so. But in every verse of the chapter, it has uh, 26 verses, and in every verse it ends with this, for His mercy endureth forever. Did you know that God's mercy endures forever? In the midst of this chapter, in this first introductory stage of John chapter 5, we literally see that the mercy of God is going to be 
wrapped in every verse that follows through verse 16. At the Pool of Bethesda, hey, it is a place of receiving mercy. But may I draw your attention to verses 3 through 9. In verses 3 through 9, we see a second truth by the side of this pool. And that's this. The Pool of Bethesda is a place of healing infirmity. The Pool of Bethesda is a place of healing infirmity. Now, the writer here it goes on to say that there's going to be impotent folk, people who can't walk, people who are blind, people who are halt, people who are withered, just people who are sick and deathly sick. They're waiting for the moving of this water. They're waiting for that angel to come down, trouble the water, that is to make the pool have some waves, and then the first person that steps in is healed. But there's something about this guy that Jesus is, is talking to that's different than a blind man. Now, if you know anything about a blind man, his hindrance is he cannot see. Somebody whose death is deaf, his hindrance is he cannot hear. Um, but this guy, the Bible says, he was unable to get there into the pool. So it implies that this individual had trouble walking and maybe he was paralyzed and couldn't walk at all. And so Jesus begins to speak with him. And, and he says in, in verse uh, 6, the Bible says, When Jesus saw him lie, here, here's the mercy of God again, that when God Almighty manifests in the flesh, would take note of somebody who is just totally sick, who cannot really walk that good, and who's an outcast in society. And the God who gave him breath takes time and notices him. Listen. That's something else. He says, When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, 38 years, verse number 5 says, He said to him, Wilt thou be made whole? So he asked. Jesus looks to him and he speaks to him and says, Will you be made whole? And the impotent man answered and said, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. So it could be possible that if this guy was paralyzed, when the angel would come, trouble the water, he would try to crawl to get in that pool. But if you know anything about life, if somebody tries to crawl and if somebody runs, who's going to get there faster? The person who's running or the person who, who is, who's just diving to get in that pool to receive healing. Well, notice what Jesus says. I like verse 8. Amen. <laughs> because this verse gives hope to those who are hopeless. It says, Jesus said, it wasn't just an ordinary guy who said this, but Jesus looks at this man and he says, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. So, this guy could not carry a bed to begin with. This guy could not walk to begin with. And this guy surely couldn't stand up to, to begin with. And Jesus looks to him and he says, Rise, pick up your bed, and start walking. <laughs> and immediately verse 9 says, The man was made whole. He was totally healed. He took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Take note of that. We'll get to that a little bit later. But, but here in verse number 8, I couldn't, couldn't but think about this time. That, that hey, that, that when I was, was down in the pool of sin, Jesus Christ said to me, Brian, rise. Take up those clothes that are consumed with the contempt, the, the, uh, the, the stains of sin, and just cast it aside and walk and arise in newness of life. Today, we can truly say, hey, hey, uh, we can receive mercy by this pool. We can receive healing of infirmity by this pool, which this man did. And by the way, Jesus heals a leper in Matthew chapter 8. He healed Peter's mother-in-law in Matthew chapter 8. And he healed the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years in Luke chapter 8. And he did many more miracles. The Bible records... But time doesn't allow us to get into that. What we see today is as we're creeping in on the scene by this pool, we can receive mercy there. We can be healed of our infirmity there. But I want to draw your attention to verses 10 through 16. 
In verses 1 through 2, we discover the pool of Bethesda is a place of receiving mercy. In verses 3 through 9, we discover the pool of Bethesda is a place of healing infirmity. But I want you to notice in verses 10 through 16, we discover this third and final truth. The pool of Bethesda is a place of cleansing iniquity. The pool of Bethesda is a place of cleansing iniquity. Check out verse 10. It says, The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured. This word cured, it means this, this guy was totally, completely healed. It is the Sabbath day. Now, if you know anything about the Old Testament, you know that in Exodus chapter 20, God uh, makes it a law uh, from the law of God, and He says that on the seventh day shall be a day of rest for you. That is, uh, if it's uh, according to our day, uh, our week, it would be Saturday, not Sunday. Uh, but anyways, it is important to have one day of rest so you can relax and, and let your body rejuvenate. But in this day and time, it was, it was something that was written down from the finger of God on a table of stone. And they recalled in Exodus chapter 20 where it says to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And uh, may I say this, that once you get into the Levitical law and the Deuteronomic law, you get about 600 plus laws that were to be kept by the Jewish people. And then these religious Pharisees and Sadducees and all the other C's and E's and whatever began to add many more laws unto those laws of God. And these extra laws were the laws of man, not the laws of God. And so here we go, and it says, it is a Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. Now, I've read the Old Testament. I've read the book of Leviticus. I've read the book of Deuteronomy, and I've never read anywhere in those books or in the Old Testament where God commanded people, hey, you cannot pick up your bed and walk, or you cannot carry your bed on the Sabbath. I've never read that. Okay, But so here we find the implication that in this day and time, these Jewish Pharisees, they added to the law of God. And... Uh, we, as modern-day Christians, look back at these uh, Pharisees and we say, Oh, wow, hmm. you've added to the law of God. How unrighteous are you? Whereas, we tend to do the same thing. In our day and time, we, listen, I'm all about having standards. But when standards become scriptures, we have major problems with the Word of God. Amen. When we start saying, hey, hey, you've got to dress this way, or you've got to look this way, or you've got to do this, or you've got to do that, and it doesn't find its place found in the Word of God, then we have taken our standards and we have elevated them higher than the scriptures. And I am here, I submit to you today that, that the Bible is telling us here that, hey, yes, we can be cleansed of our sin, and yes, we can be uh, healed of our sicknesses, yes, we can receive the mercy of God, but we should never add to the Word of God. Now, I'm here to tell you something, I don't mind saying this, but the Mormon faith or religious, religious system has added to the Word of God. And you know what the Bible says? In in the book of Revelation, some other passages that if you add to God's Word, God will add plagues on you. I'm here to tell you that the Kingdom Hall of Jehovah Witnesses, they have added to the Word of God. I am here to say this again, and listen, I say this respectfully, but Roman Catholicism has added to the Word of God. There's many organizations that are underneath the so-called umbrella of Christianity, but all they are are nothing but a bunch of wolves in sheep's clothing. And here we find in John chapter 5, verse 10, that these Jewish people, they were Jewish... By nature, and nature only, they were not Jewish from the standpoint of believing Jesus Christ was the Messiah. So look at verse 11. He answered them, He that made me whole, he's referring to Jesus, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. So, now I don't know about you, but if, but if, some, if some man like Jesus walks up to me, doesn't touch me, doesn't give me a pill to pop, doesn't give me a shot in my arm or anything like that, and just looks at me and says, hey, rise, take up that bed and start walking. I'm going to do what he says. Amen. And if my body responds to that, I'm surely going to do what it says, no, no matter what any religious fanatical individual says. 
Verse number 12 says, Then asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed was not who it was. He didn't know who it was exactly. The Bible says here Jesus conveyed or he slipped off and pulled himself away because the place was full. It was a crowded place. Verse 14 says, After word, Jesus finds him in the temple and said it to him. So he found this guy who was healed. And here, here's something that's very interesting. Verse 14 is a verse that is debated among scholarship and really sets apart denominations within biblical Christianity. And it says these words, Behold, thou art made whole. So he's been healed. Now notice these words. These are the words that are up for debate. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. Here in this passage, I believe the pool of Bethesda is a place of cleansing iniquity. Yes, you can have your sins healed by the side of this pool. But what is up for discussion here in verse 14? Now, I say this respectfully, okay, so I'm not here to, to tear down some of the... Some of the um, other different denominations who hold to, to many similar views such as we, but there are individuals within the Pentecostal holiness movement who have a different view of holiness than you or me. I believe in a holy lifestyle, living holy by the Word of God, separated to God and from the world. But there are individuals within uh, the Wesleyan holiness movement, the Pentecostal holiness movement, and some others that are come to, come to verse uh, number 14 of John chapter 5 and then John chapter 8 and, and and, and, and some other verses, and they're going to say that here, since it says sin no more, we're going to take holiness to a new level and say that as a Christian, we can live in the power of the Holy Spirit by His Word uh, in the name of Jesus and never sin again. And there's people who, who actually do believe this. You can go check out their articles of faith online or, or talk to them. In fact, um, I personally know some folks who teach this and preach this. And listen, now, just to give you a little bit of an argument on their end, more of a philosophical and, a, and an intellectual argument, they're going to say, well, have you ever murdered since you've been alive? Have you ever murdered somebody? And I myself, I'm 26 years of age, and for the f 26 years of my life, thank God for this, I've never murdered somebody. Never committed that sin, thank God. Uh, I've never done some other sins as well, but there has been sins that I have done and I'm guilty of. So with that in mind, some are going to say, well, if you've never murdered somebody before, then isn't it possible for you to never tell a lie? Well, I guess if I've never murdered somebody, I guess it is possible for me to never tell a lie. So that's kind of the logic they're going to come into, but, but I just I have an idea for you. Why don't you go try living perfect and uh, let me know how that works out for you. <laughs> because listen, I've tried it and it doesn't work. Jesus comes on the scene in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, and, and you have some of these religious Pharisees who are saying, well, hey, as long as I am just sh looking window shopping and not actually shopping, it's okay. So in other words, as long as I am looking upon a woman or for you ladies, a man, and as long as I'm not actually committing the act of adultery, then hey, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. But Jesus comes and he says, if you even look upon somebody to lust after them, you committed adultery already in your heart. So do you know what Jesus does? He takes it to a whole new level to reveal that mankind is unable to live without sin. And here, this is what I believe verse 14 is revealing. It is revealing that, hey, since you've been made whole, hey, sin no more in the eyes of God. That when God looks down upon this man, now he's a new believer in Christ, that in his eyes, as a child of the living God, he's sinless. That is, the blood of Christ is covering him, and in God's eyes, we are free from sin. We are sinless, just like God. But here's the interesting part of the verse. It says, lest the worst thing come unto thee. So here's what, here's what he's saying. He says, hey, young man, if you go back to that lifestyle, that which you have come from, it's better off for you to have never experienced this situation again. We find those words in Peter. And in Peter, it says these words. Speaking of just the strong urgency of living for God, 
after we've received forgiveness. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of this world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to, to her wallowing in the mire. So Jesus is giving a strong warning to this man, saying, hey, now you've received healing, you receive forgiveness of sin, so now walk in newness of life and live according to the commandments of God. Verse 15 says, The man departed, and he told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore, verse 16 says that the Jews sought to persecute him, sought to slay him, to kill him, because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. So there they're taking their law and making it more superior than to the law of God. At this pool, it's a pretty neat pool. I would like to go to Jerusalem and check it out. It's a place where people in the days of Christ and before receive mercy. It's a place where they, they were healed of their infirmity. But it's also a place where people were cleansed of their iniquity. This man right here. He might have been impotent, but he was important in the eyes of God. Just like you and just like me. So maybe you're here today and you've never received the mercy of God. You've never been cleansed of your sin. Well, then I submit to you today that the Bible says this, that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Psalm 103 and verse number 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath He removed our transgressions from us. It's very interesting that God takes our sin in the book of Micah and He says He will cast it into the very bottom of the oceans, which is over a mile deep. So my friends, my brothers, my sisters, we have much to learn from this pool. Now it is our responsibility, those of us who have received the mercy of God and who have received forgiveness for our sins, it is our responsibility to take this message found by the side of this pool to the world. That Jesus Christ is the Messiah, that He came to die on the cross for our sins, and He rose again the third day so that we could have life and have it more abundantly. This, my friends, is what we can learn from the pool of Bethesda. Father, we thank You for Your Word. God, we thank You for uh, this great scene found within the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. And Father, we ask